Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and we have so many people who are going to be joining us for the first time this week, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And if you're here, you may have found out about us through a variety of means. Maybe you're a teacher who's been with us for years. Maybe you're in one of the, I think, 15 countries that have registered for programs this week that are here for the very first time. Either way, this is our deep dive into climate change. We are partnering with scientists at Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Department of Fisheries, notions and other research groups and organizations around the world to do 23 programs in just five days featuring scientists who have covered topics at the poles across the equator anywhere you can imagine this planet that is being affected by climate change which is all of it uh, we have a scientist for you who's going to highlight their their life experience their career in the field doing really amazing work to understand and help combat the biggest issue of our times and there is no better person to kick off this week with us today than dr jennifer provence she's one of our favorite speakers here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Her work with Environment and Climate Change Canada has taken her around the world to understand how pollutants and uh, other things like plastics are affecting wildlife in some of the most remote and amazing regions of our planet. I'm so excited to bring her in today to uh, kick off our epic week. And so without further ado, Dr. Bonche, thank you so, so much for joining us and take us away. Awesome. So excited to be here today with everyone. And I'm very excited to kick off this week of all kinds of stuff that we're going to talk about. I, my name is Dr. Jennifer Provence, and I'm going to talk about plastics and seabirds. And although you might not think this is directly about climate change, one of the things is that everything is really connected to climate change, especially when we talk about the Arctic. Uh, and so I'm going to I'm going to share a little bit about how I got to be a scientist and some of the really cool work that I get to do in mostly Arctic Canada. But as Jesse said, I've been really privileged and get to travel all over the Arctic. And so I, I hope to share a little bit about that with you today. So first of all, yeah, seabirds and plastic pollution. This is something that plastic pollution, lots of us know a little bit about and, and hope to share with you a little bit more. And then, and then seabirds, most of us, especially in North America, don't necessarily live in a place where we can see seabirds, but seabirds are those birds. They're a little different than the robins or the sparrows that you might've seen on your way to school today. They're actually the birds, they go out in the ocean, they live there all year, and then they actually come back to breed. And so this is a pair of thick-billed murres. They're a pair of birds that spend their entire lives at the ocean, except they come back to lay their egg. And you can see that little tiny cliff that they're standing on that little ledge is exactly where they, they lay their egg, which is kind of crazy to think about. And what I'm really interested in is how they eat plastics. Uh, so murres and other birds, they can find uh, plastics on the ocean and they eat it. And so all those little pieces that you see in the middle are actually pieces of plastic that we've picked out of the stomach of a seabird, which is kind of crazy to think about. And then the picture on the other side, it's, it's hard to tell, but that's actually my friend Sarah's hand. She's got a blue glove on because we wear all the protective gear in the lab. And that's actually a little tiny seabird stomach. And you can see her thumb and finger holding those tweezers or forceps there. And she's opening up a stomach and those are plastic bits that you can see inside. So we've got seabirds, the plastic bits, and then that's how we find them at the right in their stomachs. And so this is the type of work that we, we do a lot on. But before I go into that, I want to talk about how I became a scientist. So I, I'm not sure where everyone is around the world today, but for those of you who are kind of in that southern Ontario region in Canada, I actually grew up in Brampton, so maybe not very far away from some of you. And so that's a suburb of Toronto. I grew up outside of Toronto. I was raised by a single mom and, and always loved the ocean and hanging out in the woods and going outside. And I was actually the first person in my family to get a PhD. And so it was, it was pretty exciting. It was a, there was a, a, a lot of things happening and, and it was just a path that I, I found and really enjoyed. And my job as a scientist is really varied. I, I definitely work in the lab. So there's the, the, you know, there's often the lab coat that I wear, but most of what I actually do is talking to people. And so this is actually me in one of our Environment Canada buildings talking about plastic pollution and birds. And so this is what I actually do a lot of. Science is, is often about doing and counting and looking for things, but it's also doing a lot of talking and explaining and, and thinking about the things that we find. And then that's actually a picture of me in the field. And so this is what I do a lot of the time when I'm not in the lab or talking to people as we go out and we catch birds. We work with Inuit harvesters, hunters in Northern Canada, and we look at the health of birds. And so we're really interested in how healthy the birds are. 
And so that, that's kind of sometimes hard for people to understand, like, what is health, right? When we think about health for, for people, we think about nutrition and, and your diet and your exercise and, and your mental health. But what does it mean for a bird? And so I like to stop and think about this for a second. So the idea is, is if your habitat is intact, so if the forest or the ocean or the prairie that you live in is, is healthy, it's intact. So we're not worried about the habitat side of things. We're not worried about the forest getting cut down. And we're also not worried about harvest. So lots of the species I work on are, are hunted species or harvested species, right? They're, they're important for people and cultures and nutrition. Uh, and, and so we're not worried about harvest. Harvest is okay, it's at a sustainable level, but you still kind of might have some issues. It's often because there's parasites or pathogens, actually infectious disease, kind of like um, coronaviruses or colds like we have. Wildlife can get them too. And then also contaminants and plastic. These are all the things that kind of fall onto my desk, all these health things, right? So it's, it's not a habitat problem. It's not a harvest problem. It's a health problem. And these are all the things I work on. And so it's really great. I get to work on a whole bunch of different things. But a lot of the things I talk about uh, and, and spend a lot of time thinking about is actually plastic pollution. And, and I work mostly on plastic pollution in Canada, but we, we of course, connect through a lot of our work with partners in, in other countries and other parts of the world. And a lot of what I try to do is convince people that plastic is not just a middle of the ocean problem. And so a lot of us have heard about the, the North Pacific gyre, this floating island of plastic in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, and, that's, and that's true. There's lots of plastics in the middle of the Pacific, but it's not just the middle of the ocean that is a problem. And so we talk about how birds actually are ingesting plastics in Canada, uh, in the Great Lakes, for sure. Uh, and actually, some of my work is actually thinking about how birds might actually bring plastic back into the land from the ocean, which is kind of crazy to think about. So before we go any further, I want to have a little bit of talk about plastic pollution. So there's two types of plastic pollution. There's what we call industrial pellets. These are the things that, so plastic actually is part of oil and, and natural gas. It comes out of the, the earth, right? So oil and gas come up and parts of it get um, siphoned off for things like aircraft fuel and, and the fuel that goes into your car. But part of that actually gets removed off and it gets formed into plastic. Uh, and so it gets formed into these little pellets. There's, they can add color to it. They can add other chemicals to make it uh, resistant to the sunlight and flexible if they want it to be flexible or really hard if they want it to be hard. Those are all little nurdles and we call those industrial plastics. Then those, those big containers of those little pellets actually get shipped off to plastic factories and get shaped and reformed. And the chairs that we're sitting on, probably the desks, the computers that we're all using, you know, the headphones that I'm using, those things all get formed into user plastic. And so we call those slightly different things. So there's two types of plastic. Um, unfortunately, it's been estimated that about 20 billion pounds of plastics get entered into the ocean each year. And unfortunately, things like birds actually find those plastics and ingest them. And so this is a picture by Chris Jordan. He's done a fabulous job of uh, photographing albatross chicks uh, in the Hawaiian islands. And so you can see a lace and albatross chick here. And you can actually see the plastics in the stomach. You can see some, some bottle lids. You can see a little bit uh, lighter there. And it's actually been estimated that about a dump truck of plastics enters the ocean every minute. So according to the timer I can see on my screen, since we started this, this series, this episode with Jesse, it's about nine and a half dump trucks of plastics have entered up to the ocean. So you can imagine it's like beep, 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 you know. And so from all sources all around the world, plastics is entering the ocean. And so it's happening in, in real time as we're learning about this, which is important to understand. And so again, these are some images by Chris Jordan. These are examples where birds have in ingested plastic, they've eaten plastic, mostly because their parents have brought food back and they get fed 
fish and other things, but they're also getting plastic. And so you get these plastic pieces inside the stomach of these really young birds. And unfortunately, it makes them feel full. So if you have ever had a holiday meal, everyone has those big family and friend meals where you eat too much, but you feel so full, but it's so good, you want to eat a little bit more. It's actually your sensors in your stomach that are actually stretching as your stomach gets full and it sends a signal to your brain to stop eating. And what happens is, is these birds get full of plastic so their bellies feel full and so their mind says stop eating. Um, but of course there's no nutrition in plastics and so they're, they're feel full and yet malnourished or uh, don't have that nutrition at the same time, which is a real big problem. Now, plastic pollution is not new necessarily. Um, and one of my favorite kind of natural experiments that happen is the rubber ducky. And I don't know if anyone's heard about the rubber duckies, but this actually happened in the 1990s. And so a big shipping container of these rubber duckies actually was lost at sea, it went overboard, and they lost about 29 thousand rubber duckies in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It was actually sailing uh, from Hong Kong to Tacoma, Seattle, uh, sorry, near Seattle. And, and, and these rubber duckies were released into the ocean. And because of the way the rubber duckies were made, they were very specific. They didn't have a hole in the bottom. They weren't squeaky rubber duckies. They were just normal rubber duckies. But these rubber duckies floated around the ocean. And there was a scientist named Charles Edmeyer who tracked these rubber duckies. And from tracking these rubber duckies all around the ocean, we learned about how ocean currents move, how water moves, how surface um, waters interact with each other. But the big thing that I think is that they, they we actually tracked, not we, but the scientist um, group who worked on this actually tracked the rubber duckies moving from the Pacific into the Atlantic. So the, the, ducky, the duckies overboard happened in 1992. And as late as 2007, these rubber duckies were uh, showing up in Europe. And so it really shows us that plastic moves around the oceans and how it moves around the currents. But I think actually more importantly from a plastic pollution, it shows us that plastic can hang out in the ocean for a long time to the point that these rubber duckies 15 years later were still intact, right? They were still intact and they were identifiable as these rubber duckies that fell out. So a lot can be learned about thinking about plastics in all these different ways. Now, if we go back even further, we actually did it as a project a few years ago where we dove back into the literature and this, this bird, it's called a Wilson storm petrel, actually was reported in 1838 to have a little piece of a candlestick inside its stomach. And I think the reason why this is important is that it shows us that birds sometimes don't eat food, right? So they'll eat anything kind of floating around the surface. And you can see this picture um, shows this bird, their, their storm petrel group actually uses their feet and they kind of dance along the surface. And so they're kind of just dancing along the surface using their feet to and feathers and wings to fly and kind of skip along. And they'll eat anything on the surface of the water, um, including candlesticks and including plastics. And so this is a this is something that the seabirds unfortunately are, are very vulnerable to. They they kind of they very much feed exactly where plastics float in the ocean, which is a challenge for these birds now that we have plastic pollution in the ocean as well. And so this is a map of Northern Europe. And I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but one of the things that I like about this is that in this area, it's called the North Sea. They've actually used seabirds. It's a special seabird called the Northern Fulmar to monitor plastic pollution in this region. And I put these up in you know, 1972, there's the London Dumping Convention in, in 73 and 78. These are all important because they're laws. And so these laws and policies were actually put into place to prevent pollution from entering the ocean. So it's the same type of law, but it's actually, you know, it's against the law to litter, right? We can't just throw garbage out the window or drop it while you're walking. That's against the law. It's exactly the same in the ocean. It's against the law and has been for many, many decades to, to dump plastic into the, into the ocean or any garbage for that matter. Um, and so what's really cool is that we, we actually use seabirds to track that. And so there's this bird, the Northern Fulmar, that they use to track that pollution. And in Canada, we actually have the exact same um, birds. And so these Northern Fulmars, this bird that's very similar, kind of 
feeds along the top of the water and is used under law in, in Europe to track plastic pollution. We have these birds in Canada too. And in fact, we have these birds on all of our coasts. And so you can see the map there. The birds breed, so they come ashore and have, have their eggs every year where the, the pink part is. And and then the blue part is actually where they overwinter and then and then the purple part is where they're found all year. And so what we've done is we've actually looked in a, several of these different sites and we've looked at four different sites for their plastic pollution. OK, so this is where there's going to be a little bit of a test. So we have four sites and we the one is on Vancouver Island, one is Prince Leopold Island, way up at the top of the of the Arctic archipelago. We also have the Labrador Sea, and then Sable Island is in Nova Scotia. And so I'm going to show you two different baggies of plastic pollution. Um, and then I want you to tell me where you think the birds who have the most plastic pollution live and the birds who have the least plastic pollution live. So the first bag is this big. So you can imagine that if I was a bird, this is how much plastic, you can see all the little bits of plastic in it. This is how much plastic I would have in my stomach. All right. So the birds, one of the sites in Canada that we have on the map, if I was one of the birds, this would be how much plastic they had in, this, in their stomach. So the same thing for you. If you were a bird, you would have this much plastic in one of your stomachs. And then the, the second one I'm going to show you is the smallest amount of plastic. So even all of these sites, we didn't find any zeros with all the birds who had empty. And so you can imagine, this is the second one. It's a very tiny amount. I'll just show you. It's very little. It's just a little bit of plastic, but it's still plastic. And so you can imagine, this is my human equivalent of the bird plastic in their stomach. So it's very, very small. And so now what I want you to do is it, with your teacher, I want you to type in which site do you think has the most plastics and what site do you have think has the least plastics? So you have four options here. There's Vancouver Island. Do you think it has the most or the least? Prince Leopold Island, which is way up in the Arctic, most or least? Labrador Sea, which is right in between Canada and Greenland, you know, we, again, most or least, and then Sable Island off of Nova Scotia. Do you think it has the most plastics or the least plastics? So I want you to take a second and actually type in, and Jesse might jump in here and, and communicate for me, which yeah. ones are the most and which ones are the least? So we've got folks uh, that are live in the broadcast. If you want, there's the chat bar on the right of the screen and you guys can type there and figure out what you think is the most and the least. If you're on YouTube, and I know we've got Mr. Patrick, Miss Skipwith, uh, Miss Shelby's class and more. If you guys want to type in the chat bar on YouTube uh, where you think the most and least are, please do. I'd love to relay your answers to Jennifer. I'm going to give you guys like 30 more seconds. We're going to see what you guys think. So our, our first answer, Mr. Patrick's class thinks the most is on Vancouver Island. I don't okay. know. And it, no, no, oh, a bunch of the private chat. Vancouver the most, most in Sable in Vancouver. Uh, so people definitely think that uh, the coasts that are sort of closer to the U.S. have the most. Um, yeah, Vancouver the most is our like universal pick. Prince, <laughs> Prince Leopold Island is the least is our guest from Miss Siggy's class. Does anyone on YouTube have a thought of the least? I'm thinking you guys might be pretty good. Most Prince Leopold, that was interesting. I like that. We're going mm. in the class, throwing it up a, a little bit different. Prince Leopold Island is the least. So most people think the least is on Prince Leopold Island. Some people Labrador Sea is the least, but Vancouver, like universally the favorite for the most. So tell us about it. What's going on? Okay. So first of all, for those of you said that Prince Leopold Island, those high Arctic sites had the least, great job. You guys had that right. And so for, for sure, with climate change, what we're expecting is as the ice reduces in the Arctic, we're thinking that the, the flow is going to change and we're going to get more plastics in the Arctic. But for now, the, the Prince Leopold site definitely has the least. So for those of you who guessed that this little tiny bag was the human equivalent in the Arctic, you got it spot on. Now, the one who had the most, just as a reminder, right? This is the human equivalent. If I was a bird, this is how much I would have, right? If this is a tricky one, if you said in the uh, Sable Island, you got it correct, 
Absolutely. Um, and so it's tricky though between Vancouver Island and Sable. So by save by weight, and it's a tricky one, by weight, Sable Island birds have more plastic than any of the other sites. But the funny part is, is that if you're counting by pieces, the number of pieces, actually Vancouver Island has more pieces. And so Sable Island has the most by weight. Vancouver Island has the most by number. So I would say that you're actually all right. You, you Those were really great guesses. Um, and you can see how it's actually kind of challenging to, to quantify all always. And it can be different for, for the different birds. And so one of the things that we have we have done is that we actually have looked in, in other seabird species because you might think that, well, seabirds are all the same. They all feed at the sea. But in fact, we actually have northern fulmars who have very high levels of plastic. And then we have black lake kittiwakes, thick bill murs, black gillimus. These are other species of birds. They don't have as much plastic. And so kittiwakes, although they're surface feeders, um, they have low levels of plastic. And then the divers, the birds actually dive in the water. They feed on fish. They have, they have almost no plastics. And so this is something that we're exploring more. But certainly northern fulmars, those are the really big ones that we're interested in. Now, I also have this student, uh, Sahar, she actually has worked on gulls and she looked at all the plastics inside a gull stomach. And so you, you can imagine that gulls that you see around uh, town, wherever you live, there's probably gulls. They eat all kinds of stuff. And so we're interested in, in looking at gulls. And we actually have a project right now that's looking at gulls before COVID-19 before uh, we've uh, the global pandemic and now afterwards to see if we can actually see things like gloves and masks um, in there. And so I'm not sure about where you all live, but we're walking around where I live. We actually see gloves and masks, disposable gloves and disposable masks kind of in the garbage and floating around. So we're actually going to start to look and see if we can see this in the gull stomachs. Because again, if it's plastic and it doesn't end up in the right place, it ends up in the environment, then the birds can actually um, eat it and ingest it. The other thing that we do is we actually look at birds, um, what we call the regurgitation or their bolus. So this is where it's going to get a little gross. So I apologize if anyone's going to approaching lunchtime. But birds actually kind of regurgitate. They throw up this little pellet. Um, and these are Arctic skuas. And this is a, a work that my colleague Shuer Hammer has done. Uh, and he actually did this in the Faroes where he's from. And can actually collect this little, you know, little bolus, this little throw up that the birds use. And you can actually look and see uh, the, the, the birds eat other birds. So we can see black lake kittiwakes or northern fulmars or puffins. And you can tell us by the bone. Shearer is so good that he can tell what bird it is by the bone. But we also see plastics. And so you can see that little yellow arrow and you can find out the plastic. So we actually know that birds are ingesting plastics and throwing up plastics, which is kind of a good, a good thing. One of the things that we're, we're really interested in is whether older birds have more plastics or younger birds have more plastics. And what's really cool is this is some data from the North Sea. And this is over, over time. But think about that the adults, the teachers that you're with, their levels would be this red line. So over time, um, we see that the, the adults always have lower levels. And what's really interesting is that these non-adults, that would be all the students who are listening, this blue line, this would be your bl blue line. And so if we, if we looked inside the stomachs, all the adults at your school, if you were a bird, if you were a fulmar, they would all have these low levels. And the kids, all the students would have all these higher levels. So in the world of birds, the younger birds have more plastic. And we're not really sure about that. We think it's because they're, they're not as, as experienced at feeding, but this is something that we're really interested in why those young birds have more plastics. The other thing that um, we've started to do more of is usually when we look at plastics, we look at their stomach. So this is the picture of a stomach of a bird. So this is kind of like the throat, the esophagus is way up here. And then we have this big stomach part. This is where all the food sits. And this is the part that we usually look in for plastics. It's where the plastics get 
stuck, right? But then there's all these intestines all the way down to the cloaca. And the cloaca is actually where they, they poop out. And so what we did is we looked in the in the stomach, we find big pieces of plastics, no big deal. But we actually had a, a student a few years ago where they looked at the poop. So we look at the poop of the birds and guess what we find? Plastic pollution. And so these are all pictures of pieces of plastic that were found in the poop of the seabirds. And we've done this more often. Um, and, and this is a kind of a funny slide. It's got, the, but I wanted you to show you, this is how we work with the communities. This is what we, so the birds are nesting up here on the cliffs. And then we camp down below. We, we have community members, Inuit harvesters that we work with. We ride in these small boats, these small canoes, and we camp below the bird cliffs. And then these are the birds, they hang out on the cliffs. And we actually had a student who looked at their poop again. And so we find these little plastic threads. These are microfibers, they're in the poop. Uh, we can look at them chemically. We work with chemists, which is really cool to tell us what kind of plastics they are. Are they polyethylene or polypropylene? So we start to use our chemistry too. And the student who worked with this, she actually counted the plastics. She, she, she researched how many times a day the birds poop. And then she estimated for these two species, the MERS and the FOMERS, how many microplastics we think that they poop back onto the land every year. And she actually estimated that the MERS poop 45 million pieces back onto the colony every year. And full MERS poop about th 3 million plastic pieces back onto the colony every year. And we do this work with the local uh, communities. And uh, in this part of the world, it's indigenous territory is Inu Inuit, the Inuit Nunagad. And so we work with these communities to figure out how pollution is actually affecting those local environments. Uh, and then the last thing I just want to mention, we're also really interested in how chemicals actually can affect plas or the animals. And so these are two classes of, of plastics. These are UV stabilizers and antioxidants. And I, I like putting the images up. It reminds me, you know, these are these are complex chemicals and we work with our, our chemist friends to, to, to think and work on these things. And we find that some of these chemicals go more into birds and some of these chemicals go more into other animals like seals. Uh, and this is specific to the Arctic. And so this is something that we're thinking a lot more about. So there's the physical plastics, but there's also these chemical plastics that we're really interested in. And that's important because a lot of these species are food. And so uh, in the in Inuit Nunagad across Northern Canada, Greenland and the US, these birds are very important for harvest. And, and when we think about green and, and again, minimizing our impacts from climate change, these local food sources are some of the healthiest and low carbon impacts um, species that people can get in those regions. So we, we're working with all kinds of groups to think about how these are, are healthy choices for food and healthy wildlife as well. And I am super happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Ravanche, for that awesome talk. I love the enthusiasm we got from all our participants live and on YouTube in that interactive bit, so that was great. Um, we're gonna dive in with questions now. So if you're on YouTube, share questions in the chat bar. We'll take as many as we can. We've got groups joining us from Alberta, Quebec, across Ontario and New York State, so welcome into all of you guys. Um, I'm gonna kick us off with a question from uh, Miss, uh, our Suzanne's group uh, joining us in Quebec. They've got a virtual school online. So they passed along ocean cleanup efforts. I mean, I think a lot of us might have heard of these as classrooms where we go out, we get all the trash out of the ocean, we drag it to some landfill somewhere. Are these effective? Are, are there something that we should be really doing or investing a lot of money in? What's the, the deal in your perspective? <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. And it is certainly one that lots of people are thinking about right now. And I think the important part about the ocean cleanup is that it's one tool. And so you can imagine if you had a leak in your basement, what is the first thing that you would go and run to do? You would definitely grab a bucket along the way down the stairs. But the first thing you would do is actually run to turn that tap off. And so kind of pollution, plastic pollution is kind of like that. There's a there's a leaky, a leaky system. We have a leaky system that is allowing plastic pollution to flow into the environment. And then absolutely what we want to do is grab that bucket, you know, start to empty the basement of water, right? We want to start pulling that plastic pollution out of the ocean. 
What is probably the most effective is actually to turn the tap off. And so we need all hands on deck. We need to turn the tap off. We need to stop plastic pollution from entering the ocean. And we also need those efforts to start to clean up that pollution, which is there. And, and especially some of the big stuff like, like nets, um, those are going to break down into microplastics, which can be a big problem for a, a lot of different reasons. And so one of the things I always try to address is that although ocean cleanups are important and they're an important tool in our toolbox, what's maybe more important is turning the tap off. Yeah. And so we have to turn that tap off to stop that flow into the environment or else those cleanup events are in cleanup systems are just going to keep going over and over and over again. So yeah. all of, and I, and I try to stress this, you know, we, we work with wildlife people like myself, we work with indigenous communities, we work with chemists. There are a lot of different people that are working on this issue and we certainly need all the tools in our toolbox and we need all hands on deck thinking about this from a, a lot of different ways. And so I, I'm supportive of cleanup events, but in context of solving the problem or, or getting at the root source of the problem as well. Yeah. We had a program on the other day on conservation efforts and people talked about de-extinction, bringing things back from the dead with cool DNA te technologies. And I mean, that is conceivably possible, but if you just protect the ecosystem, you'll save species so much more effectively for so much less money. You know, sending a fleet of ships out to the middle of the ocean to try and pick up trash and bring it back is exorbitantly expensive. It's important. But if you have something like, say, Mr. Trash Wheel, which I encourage all our groups to check out when they're done, you know, for a million dollars, you block up a river, you collect all that trash and you prevent it from getting into the ocean. It's also a tourist attraction in Baltimore, which is really cool. So great solutions, uh, you know, often are proactive. It's something where you're preventing yeah. it from happening in the first place for climate, for plastics, for whatever conservation topic you're keen on. Great question, guys. Um, I want to go to our help environmental leaders, grade 10s, Mr. and Pleasures class uh, in London, Ontario. Come on in, guys, and go for it. Hey there, how are you? We've got Angelina here with a question. Hi, I was wondering um, what kind of like plastic object is most commonly found while you're dissecting bird stomachs? Like, is it straws or bottle caps or what is it? Yeah, great question. So the birds that I work on are actually quite small and they don't typically have intact pieces. And so that's a really tough thing for us to figure out. We don't often get a whole piece. We do find pieces of bottle lids in the birds. So that's definitely one. Um, a big one that we don't talk about very often is cigarette butts. We actually are starting to find cigarette butts in the birds and we don't think about them, but they are plastic, right? They're, they're a slightly different form of plastic, but we start, we're starting to see those more and more. We see lots of hard fragments. We see lots of fibers. Um, but one of the ways to address your question is we have started to pair our data from the birds with beach surveys and certainly, you know, straws in the environment, bottle caps, coffee cups, coffee lids, those are really big ones. And when we actually start to look at the data, the big data from things like uh, the Great Canadian uh, Shoreline Cleanup or the Ocean Conservancy or Marine Debris Tracker, these are all programs that are tracking the data uh, from people cleaning up beaches. The primary uh, source is food wrappers. And, and so that's a, that's a really big one. Um, and I would, and I, they're they're both kind of food to go wrappers as well as as food from the grocery. So it's food wrappers. So that's a really big one um, that I think is is a great one because we can all tackle it. Uh, and and often one of the questions that I know probably I'm going to preempt Jesse here is you know what are some of the solutions. And some of the solutions that we could all do because we all eat food, right? We all go to the grocery store. We all, you know, probably take, have takeout at least, you know, at some point is to think about what those containers are and where they go. And so I would challenge everyone to go to the, the grocery store or think about, uh, you know, thinking about who you order food from and whether those containers are recyclable, whether they are compostable, whether they're reusable. And I, I have a six year old daughter, she's in grade one and we, uh, we try to do litterless lunches, but that doesn't necessarily mean unwrapping everything at home and putting in our garbage here and then sending it to school. It actually starts way back at the grocery store. And what are the things that we can buy that don't have an extra layer of power? What can we put in a reusable bag at the store uh, and then, you know, pack lunches with? And so it's actually food items that are the biggest kind of 
prevalent thing in most of our accounts. And we see that a little bit in the goal work. And, but the cool thing is, is that because we all have food, we can all tackle that actually through very small actions, but doing it every day. And I promise you, if you start to think about it, you'll actually see the garbage in your own kitchen, you know, decrease over time. Over the last few years of running these programs, this has been something that I've started implementing in my own life. It is, it's so easy when you go to the grocery store and you get apples or bananas, you don't need to put them in that plastic bag to put them in your grocery bag. Just put them in the grocery bag. Make sure they don't get crushed, obviously. But those sort of things really do make a huge difference. So one thing uh, neat too, uh, certainly for our Canadian classrooms and there are American equivalents as well, um, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is an amazing program. You can check out data on beach cleanups around the world um, through their program. And I know the pandemic adds an extra element to this, obviously and makes it a little less safe than it would normally be. But with light at the end of the tunnel for that, check that out. Anyone can organize a shoreline cleanup and really make a positive difference uh, wherever they happen to live. So cool programs out there, guys. Let's go to Mr. Honor Fox class. Uh, again, Lido Beach, New York, our grade 10s. Come on in and take us away. Hey. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, so one of the questions that came up here is how long do the plastics actually uh, stay in the stomachs of the birds? And is it possible that the older birds can just expel through the bolus the, the larger pieces, or is it just stuck there forever? Yeah. Yeah, great question. And certainly one that we have thought a little bit about. The, so the thing about the fulmars is they kind of have two parts to their stomach. So our stomachs, it kind of goes in the esophagus and then we have a, um, a stomach or a gizzard or crop. It's, it's where our stomach is. But in fulmars, one of the things I didn't talk about is the way that they actually protect themselves is they have this, it's called a proventriculus and they actually have oil in there. And so when we're, when we're studying these birds and a part of my program is we actually collect the eggs from the adults and we look at contaminants in the eggs. And when you go down to a fulmar nest, what the, what's the thing you have to be careful of is they actually projectile vomit oil at you. So it's just like, and so they have two parts of their stomach. They have this proventriculus that they can regurgitate, and that's where they get this projectile vomit oil, which is really disgusting if you get it. And then they have a tight narrowing, and then they have this area um, of the stomach, which is where their plastics are. So they so in fulmars, the reason why we use them as indicators is because once they pass this kind of projectile vomit oil section of their stomach, they can't regurgitate it any longer. And so the the general feeling is is that any plastics that we find in the in the proventriculus, the projectile vomit area, is probably plastics from the last couple of days, but in the second part of their stomach, in the in the in the main part of their stomach, those plastics have probably been there for several months. And the idea is is that the the birds also will eat stones and and they fish. There's fish bones and other things going on, and the plastics probably wear down over time, which is why we find it in their poop. Um, and then, but it actually probably sits there for several months. And this is why the chemicals from plastics are a bit of a problem. And so chemicals are added to plastics. Chemicals are a part of plastics. And what that happens is when the plastics are sitting in the stomach for those months, chemicals can actually start to leach out of the plastics and enter the body of the birds. And so that's why it's this double whammy of physical plastics and chemicals from those plastics. And so that's a bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge. So the idea is, is that we, we know, we don't know exactly how long bigger pieces are probably in there longer, but it is several months. And so what we think is that the birds who, who are younger have less experience and are ingesting. And I think probably um, this is uh, kind of where we're thinking now is that the, the younger birds actually have more plastics because they're sitting on their nest and the adults are coming in and feeding them part of that projectile vomit and they're getting delivered lots and lots of plastics. Um, but they haven't had the same amount of time to break them down. And so it's, it's, it can be complex, but we think it's a bit of both. We think that they're, they're, they're maybe inexperienced and in picking up plastics off the ocean, but they're also just getting a lot of plastics before they can even leave the nest, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. 
I, I love not only that, the, you know, you answered the main question in a very detailed way, but every time we get a question, I love this about you, Jen. It's just, it's like four, the next four questions in a row that everyone was asking are just like done. So it's like, where do we go now? Um, Miss Siggy's class, I'll, I'll take you guys live in a second. And then we've got a few great YouTube questions. We'll try and get another round in if we can. Uh, but Madam Siggy also joining us uh, in the TV Hi. DSB. Come on in, guys. Hi. So my students wanted to know, the question is kind of twofold, but how many birds are like killed by this plastic pollution each year? And then kind of going off of that, how does that affect like bird populations? Wow, another really great question. So the easiest thing is we don't know and we would like to know more. So how many birds are killed a year? Probably from plastic pollution ingestion. It's actually probably very few. The biggest ones are the lace and albatross chicks in Hawaii, we know that those young birds die of malnutrition every year. We think that they're pretty low numbers, um, but we're talking probably hundreds of chicks, probably not too many more than that, but they are the extreme example. Um, and so, th but there's also these other sublethal effects and I'll, I'll circle back to one of the questions I can see. We know that those chemicals are actually affecting the birds and it's not great for them. But the idea that we think is happening is that the plastic pollution, kind of like how climate change is also affecting their fish that they eat, how many fish are available to the birds, where the fish are. They are, it's a little bit like a neat, um, sorry, straws on the camel's back, right? So these birds are experiencing increased chemicals in terms of flame retardants. Uh, they've had chemical exposure for, for many years. They're also experiencing reduced fish because of climate change and fisheries. They also are experiencing the impacts of physical plastic. So they may not be eating as much over time. They've also got the plastic additives laying on top of that. And, and some of the plastic additives are, are endocrine disruptors. So they are affecting their hormone system and in these developing birds. Um, I also work a lot on fisheries. So some of the birds are being caught by fisheries accidentally and, and uh, you know, a little bit of a link. They're plastic, the nets are plastic, so they're getting tangled. And so we don't think of plastic, we, we don't believe that plastic pollution is kind of like the number one thing that's happening. But we work in this, uh, and a lot of my work is in this cumulative effects. And so the idea is, is that they're getting these kind of these things piled on top of each other. They're getting less food, they're getting more contaminants, they're getting more stress. They're, um, you know, the eggs are getting chemicals that are endocrine receptors. And this is probably having a cumulative effect on populations. And so there are very few kind of wildlife species in the world that kind of have one thing that is really kind of dragging them down. And we think that plastic pollution, again, is one of those things, but it's not the culprit. And so, but the idea is, and this is where my work, I, you know, I have hope for, is that the thing is, is that sometimes climate change and even habitat destruction is really hard and really complex. And frankly, you have to get a lot of people to come together to deal with those things, right? Think about climate change. It's gonna take a lot of us doing a lot of things. Plastic pollution, on the other hand, we know it's having an effect, but it's actually got some simple, simple solutions, big solutions that we all have to do together. But the solution is use less plastic. And to tie it back to climate change, right? Cl plastic is from oil, right? So if we can reduce our use of plastics, we can reduce our use of fossil fuels, we can reduce the levels of climate change. And then as things start, you know, to continue to unfold, we can reduce one of the pressures off of these birds that might actually happen a little bit sooner. And so again, it's not this, it's not this one thing that's happening, but we we definitely think that the birds are being affected by it. If we think about plastic nets, it's a slightly different. And we, and we do know that hundreds of thousands of birds are actually killed by plastic fishing nets that are lost or discarded in the environment every year. Um, but fisheries and plastics and nets and how that all works together is, is um, another thing I love to think about, but I'd have to give a whole other talk, which we can talk to Jesse about, but maybe not today. <laughs> well, we'll sign you up anytime after our climate week. We'll bring you back. And we'll do a whole other talk on that. But I love that you're able to answer two questions from our classes at once, and that that is fantastic. 
Um, Jen, we've got uh, about a few minutes left. So what I want to do is just sort of pick a random one of our classes, take a question from them, from some of our YouTube groups. If you want to email me the questions at our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants email, which I will put in the chat, we'll try and get you those answers as well. Uh, but our help environmental leaders, if you guys want to wrap us up uh, in London today, just unmute that mic, Mr. M. Pleasures class, and come on in. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hey there, I just kind of asked one from home. So obviously the Inuit people are um, hunting and gathering in this area. What is the, have we done studies on their health in terms of the food that they're ingesting um, and, and their health generally? Another really great question. So uh, a little, a little tiny history. So I work a lot with the Northern Contaminants Program and the Northern Contaminants Program is the number one program in Arctic Canada, Northern Canada, that's tracking contaminants in species. And that includes birds, but also whales, walrus, seals, char. Um, and so the reason why that program studied was to actually address contaminants in what the Inuit call country foods, so food from the land. Uh, and so the number one driver for a lot of our work is actually to inform studies around the health of wildlife in the context of healthy wildlife, healthy food, healthy environment. And, and, and more, you know, more recently, we often start to refer to that as one health. So healthy wildlife, healthy food, healthy people are connected. It's a, it's a one health model, which is, is gaining more and more traction. Um, but the Northern Contaminants Program and, and the Inuit people um, throughout Inuit Nunagat have, you know, this is, a, this is the way they look at the world. This is their worldview, is that it's all connected. And so while I don't study uh, human health, Every time we get data back on, on tissues and in plastics, uh, contaminants, we share that with the territorial governments, in, Nun in my case, in Nunavut. Uh, we also share it with Health Canada. We share it with Indigenous Services Canada. And so I have the privilege and the opportunity that we, we work all, uh, across all these different groups uh, very collaboratively. We share um, data so that everyone has the same information and it can be communicated in context. And I, and I think one of the points I really want to leave you with is that Canada does not necessarily Necessarily, always have a very uh, good track record of sharing this contaminant data with Indigenous peoples. And what we have learned, and what I am, I'm very happy to work in the tradition of, is that contaminants data, specifically of country foods, needs to be communicated in context. And so, while there might be contaminants in 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 the food, the country food, the species that the Inuit harvest. You know, there are also contaminants in the food that we get from the store, right? There are there are challenges on, on both sides. And so for the most part, the benefits of eating seal and whale and birds outweigh any of the contaminants. So we communicate the contaminants so that people have that information. We work with partners so that those communications can be done in context. That includes talking about the nutrition of those of those animals, as well as the potential risk that might be associated with contaminants. But for the most part, we're talking about very low levels. And where there are high levels, it's actually the territorial governments and Health Canada and the Inuit organizations and, and other organizations in other um, you know uh, regions and territories across the country that make those decisions. And so my job is to is to work with community to figure out what animals they want to test, how the, what chemicals they want to know, and then we share that data collectively to have um, a conversation that makes sure to take in that human environment and animal perspective. Um, because contaminants data can't stand by itself. It has to stand in context with the nutrition from those animals and food as well. That was a fantastic answer. So Mr. and Pleasures class just shared that in the chat as well. Uh, really detailed, really nuanced, as always with you. And again, uh, the exact reason why we chose you to kick off our epic week of climate change events. So I want to say thank you so, so much, Dr. Provence. Again, if people want to learn more about her work, uh, she is on social media at Jenny underscore pro. If you want to learn more about some of the things we shared in the broadcast too, Mr. Trash Wheel, a really, really cool program for preventing plastics from ending up in natural habitats and the great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup website if you'd like to check that out as well. All 
All our other programs are at exploringbytheseat.com. So a full week of amazing events, 22 more starting right now. So tune in on YouTube live for some camera spots. It's going to be a really, really fun festival. Dr. Ravanche, as you know what we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our, our family groups, our teacher groups. Uh, so Ms. Tram Pleasure's class, Mr. Onifrock, and Ms. Siggy's class, if you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell, you're all in the broadcast. Thank you guys so, so much for joining us for our first program.